Welcome, everyone. Thank you very much for being with us. Um, I am Pablo Perez Castelló, and I will be chairing today's session. We are going to interview Professor Manisha, Manisha Deca. Manisha was explaining to me how to pronounce the name from fairly early on, on her book, Animals as Legal Beings, Contesting Anthropocentric Legal Orders. And just very briefly about the structure, we are going to spend most of the time on the interview. It will be around one hour, more or less. And then we'll have around 15 minutes or so for questions and answers at the, at the end. Also, I know that some of you now probably are on YouTube and have experienced some problems um, registering on the Zoom call. Uh, sorry about that. We have, uh, we have uh, lots of registrations and lots of events. So we are struggling a bit with these things. And with, uh, with that out of the way, I would like to just now um, introduce our speaker today. Manisha Deca is Professor and Lansdowne Chair in Law at the University of Victoria. Her research interests include animal law, critical theory, health law, bioethics, and reproductive policy. Her interdisciplinary scholarship has been funded by the Canadian Institute of Health Research and the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. And she also held the Fulbright Visiting Chair in Law and Society at New York University. Professor Decker currently serves as director of the Animals and Society Research Initiative at the University of Victoria, as well as on the editorial board of Politics and Animals and Hypatia. She's an inaugural fellow of the Brooks Animal Studies Academic Network at the Brooks Institute for Animal Rights Law and Policy, and is a graduate of McGill University, the University of Toronto and Columbia University. Melissa, thank you very much for being with us. It's a true honor to have you. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Fantastic. So, um, well, as I was saying, we are going to uh, talk about Manisha's, Manisha's uh, Animals as Legal Beings, the book that was published this year with uh, University of Toronto Press. But before that, um, I would like us to, to, if you could tell us a little bit, uh, Manisha, about yourself and also what drove you, drove you to work in the field of animal law and critical animal studies, because as a lawyer, is relatively uncommon, especially at your, in your time, just you began, you are one of, the, if as it were, founders of animal law, one could say. So I, I just wonder what drove you to, be, to, to, to work in this field? Uh, sure, yes. Um, well, it was really like family influences when I was a teenager and going into my um, first university degree, so now um, 30 years ago and uh, then increasing academic influence. So I have to you know, credit my elder brother who went off to university before me and uh, came back with just, you know, what we would call animal rights literature that you know, was left on the coffee table or I was asking you about. Mm -hmm. And that really just opened my eyes to the practices that are usually hidden. And I just, I remember a story about uh, a mother cow and calf being separated and then what happens in transport. So then um, I, when I went to university, I started like thinking about these issues. And at that time in, I was at McGill University in Montreal and um, very much in the social science, humanities, all those kind of intro uh, introductory liberal arts courses, we were being, in, being introduced to the idea of deconstruction. So a lot of, um, you know, naturalized uh, boundaries and value dualisms that were being contested. Yet, uh, because of, you know, my like family influence, and then when I read thereafter and researched, I thought, well, why isn't the human animal boundary being contested in any critical theory we were being exposed to, whether it was like in feminist classes or post-colonial classes, for example, and, or just general political theory. And so I, started to write papers where I could and got really interested. And then when I you know, went to law school, I was knew that that's kind of what I wanted to do from high school onward. Um, I, was, I didn't really have the freedom until my third year to pursue kind of a director reading project that really took up this topic. And as I say in the book that really, it really did um, generate um, at that moment, so many years ago. And because of all my critical theoretical exposure in undergraduate years, um, especially in you know variety of feminist theory at that time in the 1990s, all the anti-essentialism debates or 
So the second wave, third wave feminism, as it's called in North America, and um, also post-colonial theory, was, which was, you know, becoming ascendant through the works of Edward Said and Gayatri Sperda. Um, I brought these to bear because it seemed just like a natural kind of theoretical lens by which to deconstruct mm -hmm. anthropocentrism and how we thought about animals. So from like within law school, I was able to start exploring my final year, bringing the critical theory from let's say more of the human realm where, where people, a lot of scholars aren't really taking up the animal issue or non-human issues and then merging it with that interest. And then I did practice for a little while, but then eventually you know, found my way back to graduate school. Again, really because of the, you know, what I perceived to be the faculty interest. And I think I was probably correct. There was really wasn't somebody I think that would have taken up the project. So I just um, waited till I was a faculty member myself. And that's where I was able to really start kind of scholarly inquiry and um, about these topics and then to start to teach on them. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the next question I wanted to ask you is what motivated you to write animals as legal beings, but hearing your response, your first answer in a way, I can already see a bit the answer to this second question. But I still want to ask you, um, what was again the kind of driving force for writing this book in particular? Yes, well, um, perhaps not obviously. I mean, one was just uh, my sense of like, what was I supposed to do as a scholar? Like I was like, I need to write a book at some point. And uh, the expectations here, um, you know, for legal scholars is a little bit different than, you know, what my colleagues are facing for a tenure in English, let's say, or philosophy. But uh, I.e., like most people actually aren't writing books. So anyway, but I, that was always an aspiration of mine. And, um, you know, I'm somewhat embarrassed by how long this book took. But then when I think of all the other things I wrote, like articles and book chapters in between, I can see why it took that long. But so one of it was just, you know, I, this, this is this, my sense of myself of what I have to do in my career. But actually, so when, you know, this, the book germinated in this director reading course, I was at law school for my undergrad at the University of Toronto. And um, I just thought, you know, that I was going, because that project really just argued for personhood for animals. Right, just it was a project that said more. I mean, implicitly because it just um, focused on what's wrong with property and taking like a what we now call a critical animal studies perspective, but at that time would have just called like a you know, eco-feminist perspective or feminist animal care tradition, which really you know I I do believe is the foundation for critical animal studies, basically taking an intersectional multi-layered perspective, right? And so, um, but then you know like as uh, my thinking on this developed over the years, I began to formulate the position that actually personhood is not beneficial uh, for animals. It's not the best we can do for animals. Yes, it's preferable to property, of course, right? But um, I, it, it's an awkward fit as I argue, and then it has you know, counterproductive effects as I argue. So actually um, that really then, when I realized, cause I started the book with you know, because I wrote a shirt grant before it where I had to kind of describe, you know, what re, uh, shirt grants are the Social Sciences Humanities Research Council, the national funding body in Canada to help support the research work. And I remember when I'm writing that grant, like I was suggesting personhood would be the outcome. But then as I started writing it and really thinking and reflecting, I said, I was like, well, I don't, I actually don't believe this anymore. So let me try to, you know, explain theoretically like why not, like knowing quite well all the strong arguments about why animals need personhood. So then the book did take on kind of an, not a new life, but a bit, a bit more kind of urgency because I knew that, you know, this is going to be a controversial position and mm -hmm. I want to be able to articulate the best that I can and, and you know, see what, what others think. So that was like a, a secondary motivation yes but and the third one is what I describe in the introduction um I really just wanted to kind of continue the theoretical trajectory of like legal scholars or scholars situated in law schools um bringing in critical theory to more kind of liberal ways of thinking of these topics and you know I don't want to suggest liberalism is all wrong of course it's not right and there's so many varieties and the book is, you know, has to be reductive in that sense and just uh, character, characterizing it a bit. But um, uh, that was a third motivation, just 
you know, to develop kind of more of this subfield within animal law, or at least to, mm. when we hear the term animal law in English, that people aren't just thinking about classic liberal approaches for these questions, but start maybe thinking about the other kind of theoretical traditions, what they have to offer. Yes. Um, that's why I, I guess animals as legal beings spoke to me so much because I'm, I come off from critical sort of theory and I began reading about animal law only like two years ago or three or something like that and I felt oh it's so based on liberal kind of philosophy the, the underpinning animal law is mainly that so when I read animals as legal beings I was oh I, at last I read this, this, this one book at, at least and um, I wanted to, to tell you by the way that I think I've, it's, this is the book I've read the most times in 2021. Uh, I, I was rereading it over the weekend. It's, I think I've read it like four times or something like that. I love it. And, <laughs> and uh, because of what you were saying about questioning personhood, Manisha, Manisha sorry. Um, in the first part of Animals as Legal Beings, you argue, as you were saying now in your response as well, that we need to go beyond the property personhood uh, paradigm. And you discuss at length, uh, at length anthropocentrism, which you argue structures the law and also the category of legal personhood. So my question is, um, why do you think that the category of legal personhood is anthropocentric and also the law, the law structurally? Because that's more or less your argument, I think. Okay, so maybe we'll start with the, um, the second part of that. Why is the law anthropocentric? So here, um, you know, I say in the introduction, I'm talking about the colonial legal order in Canada, one of them, the common law, and but saying that, you know, the argument is applicable to any anthropocentric legal order. Um, and it, when we kind of investigate using other scholars like Anna Greer's work and other scholars, we see that the law is, the common law, for example, is very much centered around um, this idea of a, like a paradigmatic person. And of course, um, in addition to that, it also classifies beings into categories, primarily property or person. Okay, and so we see that um, who gets to be persons, human beings and corporations basically, right? And ships. And so there's one argument to say, well, corporations get to be persons, so the law is not anthropocentric. Okay, but it's just admitting like this um, type of body that's in the interest of human beings to kind of to create this legal category for. So we can still see that's an anthropocentric um, intent for why corporations are persons to further kind of the, the interests of, I mean, a select uh, cohort of the world who benefit from all this corporate wealth. So, um, so the foundations in terms of the great property person divide is very anthropocentric. The non-humans don't matter. And then the law cannot see, like you can't visualize, cannot recognize non-human interests. And so you have all these complicated uh, cases about standing, who's allowed to come into court to talk about like half of an animal and who, what uh, are seen as legitimate topics for the legislature to take up and all of this. And when, so we, we see the divide as being anthropocentric, but so a lot of the book goes to saying, you know, even if we focus on the personhood um, part of that divide, we can see anthropocentric content inserted into this concept, right? So what populates this concept? Like what does personhood mean? And again, personhood scholars I discuss in the book and, and even otherwise, talk about like personhood is not a stable concept. There's not one meeting. If you canvass how uh, lawmakers, whether you know in legislatures or in courts discuss this concept, you will see a variety of takes on it. Um, but you know, um, scholars have done typologies of what typically you will see. So like Nafin's work talks about P1, P2, P3 visions of personhood, basically looking cross jurisdictionally um, she has suggested to us that you have kind of the empty vessel type of notion of personhood, which is the one that allows corporations quite uncontroversially as Anna Greer and others have pointed out to become persons um, centuries ago, right? And um, then you have kind of the religiously oriented, uh, very much from like Judeo-Christian religions about all humans are sacred. So just kind of the sacred vision of the human grounding uh, a second idea of personhood. And then you have a more legalistic kind of rationalist position where it's really this idea of a certain type of rational being that grounds personhood. And so 
um, part of the argument of the book as to why law is anthropocentric and why person is anthropocentric is that if you think of law's foundations as incredibly anthropocentric and you, you know, um, put on top of that personhood's most common iterations, which is, as others have argued, really this P3 type where we are, even when we're trying to give content to corporate rights and think of the corporation as person, as um, Anagar and others have argued, Nafin as well, we are, we are gravitating to this idea of person that invariably calls up a human agent that is this rationalizing agent. So it is very hard when we hear right now the word person, like P-E-R-S-O-N, the signifier, not to think of the human as a signified, right? And so that's why I suggest Yes, even though doctrinally it is available to us to populate the concept person with anything, that's what happened for corporations, right? Which are not even material beings, which we can't even see anywhere. There's no sense that can grab on to this thing we call a corporation, yet it's a legal person. Um, there's still an anthropocentric filter on this concept. And so, because one of the things that you didn't mention now so much, but a, one of the questions I was asking is um, why is the category of legal person anthropocentric? And I think in your book, one kind of phrase that you use a lot is this idea of the paradigmatic human person that you define as a white, able-bodied, rational, autonomous agent sort of thing. I just wanted to mention that because I, it's kind of quite, uh, it explains it very well in a brief but maybe you can say a bit more about this in the second in question I want to ask you about this notion because it's very related to this, I think. So you say in, in, in Animals as Legal Beings, uh, and I say yeah, it's one of my favorite quotes, that it is through, uh, quote, it is through dehumanization that personhood is lost. Discursively and materially, humanization becomes a prerequisite for personhood. To be a person, one has to be seen as human. Put differently, animal personhood is an oxymoron in anthropocentric legal systems. So it's a very rich quote, there is a lot there. So if you could unpack this initially, because I think it explains a lot about what you are doing in the book, I think. Sure, yes. So um, on the first point, yes, which I did want to talk about, that kind of paradigmatic person or this idea, the legalist rationalist vision of person is one where there's a certain type of rational actor. And if you really unpack this notion, like through doing a critical discourse analysis of these texts and, judge, and judgments, for example, you do get um, uh, this notion that human beings are, you know, what the law expects of us is a certain form. And that is the best way to be really, i.e. you are, kind of an economic, you are maximizing your economic interests at every turn. And you're able to do that because you're able to reason at a certain level. And you're existing kind of in this, you know, vacuum bubble where there's nobody around you, you're already an adult. So it's not about, you know, imagining children in this space. And um, uh, you don't really even have any other social characteristics or identity. So this is this idea of disembodiment. And, and you're not attached to any particular place. Really, all you're doing is going around your, about your affairs, trying to maximize your self-interest. Um, and you're using your cognitive abilities to do so. Okay, so this is law as reasonable person. And so when the reasonable person is such a ubiquitous concept, um, and it's important to so many areas of law because uh, so many of our, our, our pieces of legislation, the codified text, or even common law judgments are pivot on, you know, what would a reasonable person do in this instance? And then we know the answer to, uh, to this legal dispute. And so we have to think, well, who is this reasonable person? And, and that's the person I described. Um, and there's, you know, other scholarship on this from um, feminist legal theory and otherwise. And so, yes, it does correlate with a, a certain gender, a certain race, a certain age, a certain cognitive ability. And it's, it's, it's so exclusive, right? So um, Anna Greer's work again on the Anthropos, you know, who was lost, Anthropos was very influential to me in talking about this paradigmatic person. And um, so uh, that's one of the reasons that it is, you know, very anthropocentric. And so Pablo, can you just um, say the first part of the question now? 
So the quote you mean? The quote, yes, thank you. Okay, so that specific quote um, then adds on this extra insight to that foundation, right? So here I looked at the work of David Delaney, who has a tome called Law is Nature and other works, as well as other scholars to really kind of um, uh, build on their arguments that, again, if you do a critical discourse analysis of texts, legal texts, uh, typically um, case law, where you get a bit more exposition of some of the reasoning. And um, this is not to say that personhood is well theorized or well articulated in these legal texts, it's not. But what you also see is this idea that um, the legal person property divide pivots implicitly and sometimes explicitly on the human animal divide, right? So even though there is what Nafin calls that P1 vision of personhood available that allows corporations to be persons, really when you excavate the uh, architecture of personhood in, in the common law, you're going to see a very close correlation between persons and human and then Invariably, it's this ideal version of the human. And so it's a certain vision of the human and then property and animals. So in this kind of legal move to make animal, to push animals over to the other side, legal side, right? To go from property to person, it's like you're, we're pushing animals over to the human. So that's why I say this is an oxymoron because this category was never meant for animals, but yet we're trying to, for good reason, right? I don't wanna diminish th those quests, but uh, we're trying to push animals into a category that was never meant for them. So that's why there's this correlation between kind of a juridical sense of the self through person and the dehumanization, humanization. Um, it's, it's not like a, a loose correlation, it's a very tight one. And so it just doesn't uh, make, it's not a cohesive conceptual fit. It's not good kind of even logically to think of animals as persons, because persons really are just meant for this certain vision of the human being. And so um, elsewhere in the book, I also talk about legal scholars who made this argument vis-a-vis -vis other marginalized human groups and even non-humans that are kind of from the artificial intelligence world or the computer world, right? So, um, and they have argued that personhood is, that, you know, it just doesn't fit for these entities because of this history of personhood, uh, it's, you know, exclusionary origins, but then also the mold it sets, the, the imprint it gives for going forward. And so um, that's compelling to me, especially when we think of animals. And then one of the things I say in the book is like, you know, even if, um, we disagree with all that, or even if there is the whole, like, let's say I'm wrong about all these arguments um, about that quote and otherwise. For animals at least, right, um, which is different from women, let's say, you know, most jurisdictions of the world who are already formally legal, legally recognized as persons, right? So animals are, um, women as an example of a marginalized human group, right? So that scholarship is about, um, when it talks about marginalized human groups, these are groups that are formally legalized as persons, even at the material level, it's not a proper recognition of their rights in various spaces, right? But here we have a situation of animals who like overwhelmingly are not recognized as legal persons. So does it make sense for us to continue to battle to have their recognition go from property to personhood, which is not an easy jump for most decision makers, right? And it encounters the, oh, you're telling me that you, you're, for me to make this jump as a judge or to vote for this legislation as a politician, as an elected official, I have to, you know, believe that animals are equivalent to humans. Now I believe animals are equivalent to humans, but I know most people are not going to. So I say, instead we could devise a different term that is supposed to be, it's meant to be as protective as personhood is. It's you know, more reflective of animal's alterity, and it's not gonna encounter you know, what is, I think most appropriately characterized as a knee-jerk reaction by people in influential decision-making roles that I now have, what I'm saying is that animals are like humans and of equal moral work, which most people don't want to say, right? So I do think it has, as much as, you know, I can hear, I understand the concerns that 
you know, what is this term is like new, nobody even knows what it is. But the same reason, personhood, people have firm ideas of what it is and they don't think it extends down or it's, it's, it's too difficult to extend it for a variety of reasons that we see in some of the very contemporary judgments, for example, of now not on human rights project and otherwise that they're receiving. So, yeah. Yes, in fact, one of the things of anthropocentrism I feel is that it structures the subjectivities of many humans. And as you said, even the term, the word person, right? It's going to have a resonance, even psychologically, a person is human. So I always, I, I, something I felt is that it's as if many animal scholars, animal law scholars, I feel at least that th there is no attentiveness to these psychological factors perhaps that are going to influence a lot of decisions. And at the end, the law, you know, judges make decisions. It's not someone in a vacuum or it's not a robot. It's actual human beings in a certain historically situated context, political system and so on. So yes, I, I, that makes a lot of sense to me, but I would still like to ask you, because I do think this is one of the main sort of counter arguments I've heard and concerns that uh, some colleagues have, which is this idea that if corporations reverse, uh, you know, even idols, like they, they have persons who they are legal persons, why not animals? Um, and I, I was just wondering whether you could tell us a little bit more. I, you've already touched on it, this a little bit and you referred to Anna Greer's work in deconstructing the Anthropocene. I really like that article. I think she's very eloquent and her arguments I think are very persuasive about this. But perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about why, um, yes, how, how would you respond to the objection that corporations are legal persons as well? So if the, I think the question is, if I'm understanding correctly, that th these other non-human entities have been able to receive personhood, like shouldn't we keep trying for animals? So yeah, so part of that question is, um, part of the answer to that question is what I was saying that, um, yes, I see that argument, but you know, is personhood the best fit for animals? So let's consider um, even the kind of recent cases where we've seen, so not thinking about corporations, but where we've seen kind of the extension of rights to nature, let's say of a river, for example, um, or even uh, if we uh, look at the uh, case from earlier this year about um, Kavan, the elephant who was in um, Pakistan, so in the Islamabad court uh, recognized basically a person who write a right to bodily integrity to send Kaban to um, sanctuary in Cambodia. Um, personhood only succeeds um, where the kind of previous property use or non-personhood status of that entity is no longer seen to be necessary by the human being making the decision about personhood or valid human use, or where instrumentalization can still occur, but perhaps in more of a backgrounded way. So with rivers being persons, we are still using these rivers, right? And, and when you look at some of the scholarship on these river cases, you will see that they're still tied to human interests, whether typically collective, if it's indigenous human interests about the importance of the rivers, right? We still kind of have that link to a human collective, a human entity. And in Kavan's case with the um, elephant, it's because the judge, you know, didn't think zoos serve any purpose, especially this particular zoo just thought it was a heinous institution and all the animals deserve to be free from it and sent to sanctuary. But we know that, and so, you know, that's a wonderful result for those animals, but we know that most animals are not in industries, they're not held captive in industries that most people are going to think are heinous institutions. Even if we're against intensive farming, right, most um, people still think, well, we need to do it um, to feed, the human world, which is a myth, but this is the belief, right? And so we are not, where are most of our animals in captivity held in animal-based food systems, right? And so and the numbers are staggering and we know the violence is staggering, yet these things aren't stopping and personhood is not gonna easily attach because we, it entails widespread implications. So the personhood kind of nature claim, nature rights claim still 
allow instrumentalization, except in very rare instances where the animal use is like a zoo that must close down and all those animals can go away. But it's mm -hmm. not that that case that all zoos are illegitimate in Pakistan, right? And they all must close down mm -hmm. and all the animals must come out. And animals are all persons or all the animals must come out of the slaughterhouses or the farms. Like, this is so personhood. When we think like, let's go back to what's the meaning of personhood? It is supposed to be in the classic liberal tradition, which marks a common law of stop to instrumentalization of that level. We know that human rights have to balance, like we balance equality versus religious freedoms and rights of free speech, and lots of cases are about this this balancing act. But mm. And we are hard pressed to find a case where the court, where a, a, a jurisdiction is legally entitled to kill you so that other people can use your body, right? If you are a person. And so our, is the next logical step for personhood to be applicable at say to the farmed animals? Likely not, right? Because personhood is not carrying this weight. It's really, I would argue being instrumentalized as a welfareist concept. Um, in most of these cases. So it's not really personhood. It's not really a right, except in like, a very few instances. Um, so. And also something that I read in your work, and it's also in Anagreas in relation to this question very briefly, is that if the paradigmatic human person, we understand that is a disembodied, rational kind of entity that is detached from all relationships, this autonomous being, a corporation matches it. So when one looks at a corporation, it's a disembodied rational entity that are, clearly it's not relational being embodied in the sense of vulnerability and so on. So I, I just think that in that sense, it just matches very well the paradigmatic human person as well. Um, hence, extending um, legal personhood to, to corporations would seem relatively reasonable from that reading of the law, at least. I think that's in partly in your work as well, and Anna Greas, I thought. Yes, and so a lot of feminist scholars have said, right, you know, before me that uh, most of us, we don't come into this world um, in this image. And some of us mm. never meet this image and many of us don't exit this world in this image. So how can this be the paradigmatic person? Because uh, mm. we know the fiction that this vision of personhood, like all humans count under personhood, but there's anthropocentrism, even though all humans can't meet this fiction of the paradigmatic person, actually most of us can't. Yes, and Anna Greer's work that the, as you say, Pablo, yeah, the corporation is the one who can meet this vision. And also engaging Afine in this very year, yeah, she asks a very nice question. She says, what would legal person look like or would have looked like if the paradigmatic human person was a pregnant woman? Uh, and it's like, whoa, kind of no one thinks about that in a way. So I, I really, I, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. But yes, I, I, just because it's also related to this kind of point, more kind of critical theory on ecofeminism, because in chapter three of the book, that is kind of, it's in part one, but it's sort of transitioning towards part two, in a way, you sort of lay the, lay the theoretical foundation of your proposal for a legal subjectivity for animals, the notion of legal beingness. And the key theoretical pillars that the structure legal beingness are embodiment, relationality, and vulnerability, and also this notion of difference and radical alterity. So I just wanted to ask you first, why did you put these ecofeminist notions at the center? And why do, why do you think they matter, matter ethically as well? Okay, yes. Well, they had always been so influential to me um, and compelling to me. I really believed in them. Um, and I really do think the law needs to be shaped by them. So that's you know why I wanted to put them in the center. And so let me say, um, respond to the second part, why I think they're ethically you know, imperative. Uh, it, so if we, if we think about animals and really any suffering, you know, what, what is it that triggers suffering? Physical injury, right? And involving intense amounts of pain um, or psychological injury involving intense amounts of pain or, you know, various gradations. And um, we know that physical injuries, usually if, if something is happening to us, our body, like cutting, maiming, clipping, branding, burning, some other type of bodily violation. And psychological comes from how as beings we perceive our realities, right? And so loss from family separation, for example, grief um, are common examples. Uh, 
so to me, how can we conceptualize uh, this categorization of suffering? Well, you know, what is it? So in other words, what is it that's triggering suffering such that we want to recognize our vulnerability to suffering um, in order to have a society where we are not suffering and animals are not suffering. Okay, embodiment, right? So if we recognize those beings who are not, and as I argue in the book, you know, sentience is not a criterion for beingness for animals, that an animal does not have to be sentient to be seen to be a legal being. But sentience, you know, does qualify a lot of animal life, ours included, and it's what gives rise to our capacities to suffer, right? Especially physical. Um, Okay. And relationality is also a feature of all of our lives. And, and so I think this really is the biggest fiction of our current idea of personhood, because whereas you are able to find non-sentient life, for example, um, you know, I, it is very, <laughs> I mean, it would be a supreme challenge to suggest that any entity is not related to another. Right. And so this is the idea of relationality. So these are much more inclusive categories than that paradigmatic legal actor who, at the very least, um, uh, even if we take out the relationality aspect and the disembodied aspect is is commanded to have a certain cognitive ability, which many of us don't have. And certainly, you know, all of us, when we're babies, we do not have this. Right. And so. Um, uh, so I. I saw like this, the feminist theoretical underpinnings as really capturing what is what triggers suffering across species and also that it is much more inclusive in a way I want it to be to capture all animals because the core argument of the book is that personhood is going to privilege the human humanized animals, the ones that can meet the human benchmarks and conform to the human requirements of personhood. And the analyzed animals are, are never going to be seen this way in particular cultures. You know, Western culture is it's like what I'm really talking about here. So um, that's why I found it so like compelling. And so then both embodiment, if we you know keep our eye on embodiment and we um, focus on relationality, we then understand what it is that makes us vulnerable. Right? So then kind of vulnerability as a third is really like, you know, encapsulating the others because we want to respond to vulnerability or I'm saying the law needs to respond to vulnerability. So, you know, what, what are our bills of human rights for in, in Canada, we uh, call it a charter. And so like, what is that in legal instrument for is to kind of recognize certain vulnerabilities that we may have. Uh, most of it is, you know, first generation, classic first um, generation rights of civil liberties, but these are seen to be, you know, we need support to be able to realize our flourishing in these areas. And so the same idea can come out of like a more um, feminist origin that you need support because we're all vulnerable, right? And we have different degrees of vulnerability. So when I say we're all vulnerable, animals and humans, I don't want to flatten power asymmetries because we know there are gross and um, stark power asymmetries between amongst humans and across species, right? So, but um, what that term is meant to do for animals is to say animals are vulnerable because of their embodiment and their relationality and the law needs to you know respond to that vulnerability by keeping in mind that they're embodied relational beings. Fantastic um, and the next question I want I want to ask you it's just from chapter three and you say something that I think is really important but I want us to explore this a little bit more so you say in page 99 the critical insight that reasoning, including legal reasoning, is an emotion-based process must become normalized among legal decision makers. So what I wanted to ask you is first, if you can say a little bit about what does that mean? And also how can legal decision makers reason emotionally? I'm using here a grammar that is perhaps peculiar to reason emotionally, it even seems somehow wrong, but I think it's very right. So I, I just was wondering whether you could tell us more about this, please. Sure. Okay. So um, again, there's a, a wide variety of feminist legal scholarship that um, discusses this, but I myself was, you know, fortunate to take um, a, a law seminar course with Professor Jennifer Nadelsky at the University of Toronto, whose books, laws, relations, and otherwise really talk about um, this kind of fiction between reason and emotion. So this is obviously a dualism that a lot of critical theory attacks, but 
Professor Jennifer Nadelsky has really discussed how this gets taken up in law and why it's a problem. And uh, so it's a fiction because, you know, if you look at um, just kind of theories of the human brain even, right? So neurologists or neuroscientists, you will see like um, that you, you, we don't have like this binary that we reason without emotion or that emotional like neurons are separate from reason neurons, like this doesn't even make sense. And so it is a certain philosophical tradition that encourages us to see these as separate, right? So kind of a Cartesian view of the world, which the law has accepted. Um, colonial laws have accepted and we need to dismantle that way of thinking, this really bifurcated way of thinking. Um, so it's just, a put, it's just a plea to say, you know, this is a fiction and we have to stop proceeding on the premise that reason is divorced from emotion or emotion is divorced from reason. And part of that, uh, why, and why is it hard to do that? Why is it challenging to do that? Because in law school, at least, you know, the schools I've been to, you learn that good reasoning does not involve emotion and emotion is something to be abjured or at least kept to the side and is only for private life, right? So it builds on this public private, private split, um, which is so foundational to so many um, intellectual traditions as well. And feminists of a variety of versions have tried to dismantle. And so, um, uh, so it, uh, all of that to say, we're trying to get the law, I'm trying to be a voice too, that gets the law to accept what is reality, that we reason emotionally, we, we are emotional reasoners. Okay, now, so what does it mean? Like, what would a, a court, a judge, a human being be doing if they were reasoning emotionally? Um, well, it's to accept that there's not a binary and to understand emotions aren't, um, aren't like feelings to suppress when they occur, but actually to sit with, to dwell with, right? So, and primarily here is the emotion of like um, compassion, right? This idea of empathy, compassion, of feeling with, the feeling that this, what is going here? This social problem is wrong. These, you know, beings are suffering and we need to address this somehow legally and, and make this stop. That, you know, how do, I've just reasoned that Kind of vignette out but why are we thinking that because we we're having an emotional response to it right and so that's what enables us to reason this out so as kind of like all the emergent or growing field of law and emotions has talked about like this means that emotions have to be seen as proper forms of reasoning but then to go back circle back to jennifer nadelsky's work and she herself draws on her um educational tradition with hannah arendt to talk about you know what what is good judgment if we if we're thinking about good decision making what does it mean because we all come from our social locations we all have a situatedness right we're all embodied socially and it's not just a matter of having a physical body it's about being embodied in in networks and within the symmetries of power and so on so really what we're trying to do when we are reasoning, when we're tasked with reasoning through a dispute and arriving at some outcome, the idea is the concept of enlarging our mind, right? And so how do we, so first of all, we don't have to think the mind is divorced from reason or the body. You know, it's an older concept from Arendt, but enlargement of our mind, where what we're doing is we have to remember there are gonna be divergent viewpoints about how to handle the situation. And our reasoning process has to be able to take in those divergent viewpoints, you know, sit with them, understand them. And that, that incorporates the kind of emotions that are informing those divergent viewpoints. And then when we reason something out in a written judgment or in a oral speech in, in the parliament or what have, have you, we are being responsive, right? We're not trying to be combative, but we're being responsive and we can disagree at the end, right? But we're being responsive to kind of the community of thought. And, um, you know, can we persuade those most affected, adversely affected by a decision as to its justness? So if we go forward for animals, we have to think whatever the dispute might be, can we, uh, if we're the human decision maker and we're invariably going to be, a, it's going to be a human decision maker, right? Um, can that human decision maker imagine the animals that are most affected here, right? And come to a decision that is going to be persuasive to them or at least feel like all perspectives were taken into account and this is a balanced result, even if it doesn't go um, exactly as to what that group would want. 
right? And of course, certain things here are off the table like death right? and torture. But in terms of how we balance human interests today, that's how we would be balancing um, interests. Yes, fantastic. Thank you, Manisha. Manisha. Um, the, the next question I wanted to ask you, and you, you know this better than me, so uh, even eco-feminist scholars, it has been a kind of it, quite important, I, I, one of the most quoted uh, kind of sentences I have read is by Josephine Donovan and Carol Adams when they say that we need to listen to animals, you were talking now about being responsive, rather than to what humans are saying us about them, right? They say that animals speak, that they have a voice, that they are agents, which it has come up a little bit in what you have said so far. Yet, and you mentioned this in, at the end of chapter four and in the conclusion in both chapters, um, when one sees this table of legal beingness, agency does not come up. So it's embodiment, relationality, and vulnerability, the kind of core uh, structuring features of legal beingness. So I, I know that you, you acknowledge and you, you say animals do have a voice, they are agents, um, and so on. But still, it's, it doesn't seem to be so central. So I just, out of curiosity, I was just wondering how come or why did you make that choice? Yeah, it's such a unique question to me, Pablo, but I really appreciate it. Um, I suppose, and I don't know if this is more prevalent for those of us who went through common law education, but I always see agency as a, as a legal status. And so the idea of being an agent to me is almost, you know, an offshoot of being a person. So the law of agency, for example. And I was trying to think of what are the features that we want a new subjectivity for animals to most signal. Like what are the three features? Just as we, you know, the corollary of personhood, what comes to mind, what, how, what, how do courts talk about what a person is? This is what we want to think about what a being is. So I just never considered agency as one of the features because it had that legal register for me. Um, I guess I see it different as talking about being agentic. But then again, probably also like that as my, so it's a subtle difference, yes, but it, I think it's an important difference. So like I, you know, I valorize or I value agency, but then I, you know, kind of su suggest that um, liberal versions of autonomy are, are illegitimate. And so there is a difference. And so I draw upon all that literature you reference about agency and I do harness that. Um, but I see that more as not like here's the autonomous agent uh, that the law usually talks about, but here we have to recognize that animals can, are not just passive, but can contribute to this now new problem of how to devise laws um, and include the individuals who are going to be affected by these laws, like really include pass, you know, a general standard of the human. So yeah, I think that's why I didn't, imagine it as a fourth pillar, just because I saw it as a higher order concept and embodiment, vulnerability, and relational, relationality, I saw as concepts giving life to this the higher order concept that I wanted to construct, which is being. And then I didn't pick agency or agent as, the, as a new term, just because of the um, current legal associations that I associate the term agent with. No, that makes a lot of sense. I was also thinking, you know, because with legal standing and a lot of the in the animal movement, this idea that we need to speak on behalf of animals and so on because they are patients, they are the mute. So I, that's why I was coming from there, but I, it makes a lot of sense what you say now. Um, and then one question that I've, since I read the title of the book, and then when I read that, when you, your reference to Hydra, you said, with my apologies to Hydra, the notion of being, um, I felt I've always wanted to ask you why did you choose the term legal beingness, like that term, and whether there were other candidates as well. When you were writing the book, thinking about these things, did you think mm, maybe to, uh, there are some other options, or it was just this is the one, as it were? I don't know. Yes, no, it's a really lovely question as well. Um, I did like I did not want people to think this was like a Heideggerian. Um, informed treatise. Not that that's, you know, I'm, I don't want to say things against Heidegger's work, but it what it obviously you can see the theory that's informing the book, and I want that to be, you know, kind of come out to the reader. But so I was actually re reluctant to 
to stay with legal beings, although that's what occurred to me kind of intuitively from the get-go. But then I did, a, you know, perhaps it was just like one day where I really sat down and thinking, is there really another concept that I could trot out here and, and work with? And I just felt like, no, there wasn't. And I mean, invariably it has to do with the English language in which I am working, right? But um, so here, like we grew you know, I have grown up in this kind of anthropocentric culture um, and, you know, what is known as Canada as with the sense that, you know, humans are human beings. That is like a mainstream way to talk about human beings. And it implies by the human kind of being an adjective there, right? Or a qualifier to beings that other, there are other candidates to be beings. So it kind of builds upon a cultural acceptance that animals are also beings, right? But we don't think of them legally as beings. So why not think of them legally as beings? So, so I felt like there was a cultural foundation for people to accept that animals are beings. So, and especially um, people in positions of legal influence to accept yes, animals are beings and we can recognize them legally as beings even though definitely legal beings would entail a different legal result than what the current culture accepts or animals as well. Mm. Very interesting explanation. No, thank you very much for that. I've always felt very curious about it, so now I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the last question I wanted to ask you about um, animals as legal beings, about the book. Um, it's the issue of line drawing that you discuss at length in chapter five of the book. Um, and you say, in different parts of the book as well, that the, in introduction, in chapter four, that is the legal beingness one for people that are not familiar with the book, that legal beingness does not seek to draw clear cut divides. But you, you say, but it still needs to do so. Uh, in a way, you acknowledge that in chapter five because of the nature of the law, as it were. So my question is really about, the, but because at the same time you say that it, in a way it opens up and it doesn't draw lines in some respects. You are also saying that. So anyways, it's really about the limits of the law in the context of liberal democratic states. So my, what I was wondering was whether liberal modern states can truly accommodate for the kind of legal subjectivity you envision, or whether we can begin to see the limits of the state here when you are proposing this term. We, are, you, we, may be, we might start to think, well, maybe it's not possible or I don't know. Uh, so if you could speak to that as well. Yeah. Yes, no, it's a really important question. I mean, I do think it's a work in progress. Um, I think in very what categories we choose for our foundational legal concepts are that, you know, they, they have to be, you know, um, a little bit rough in terms of um, reductive. They are just not always going to capture everything we want. Um, that law invariably is about categories, uh, if we understand uh, that we need to kind of follow a law or not. Um, so I tried like in that chapter to really take on um, the question that, you know, just uh, stayed with me throughout and which I've heard a lot in my own talks and other, and I've seen others get right. It's like that chapter could have been called that. What about plants? <laughs> so, and I, I don't mean to laugh or take this dismissively because I'm, um, you know, uh, there, I, I did a Jotwell piece um, for a lawn literature uh, by Elise Berthenthal about trees, which was just beautiful, right? And then and reading, doing that work, I read more of that scholarship about plants and everything. And so I don't mean to make light of this, but I do think at some point, as I say in that chapter, we have to think about capacities in relation to ethical standing and legal standing. And that doesn't mean that we have to kind of rank the beings according to capacities, which is I think is what happens now. So, you know, this may be a subtle difference, but I, I do think it's a material difference. Um, can liberal democratic states ever get this right? Um, as I say, I think it's a work in progress. I do think it's a work in progress for any type of state, probably more so for, you know, a more of a challenge where you're starting with such anthropocentric foundations and you're maximizing autonomy, independence, and rationality, which we know is not universal. Um, but, and we can see the partial results already with respect to humans. Like if you think of children and how the law treats um, human children and the law, how 
we treat human children. Um, you know, the prevailing paradigm in international treaties and domestically, uh, is, you know, Western jurisdiction is the best interest of the child, right? And so, as many scholars have said, th this is not a satisfying concept or this, you know, um, doesn't get at the right results when we think of best interest or we think of it as a, a, in our own kind of um, culturally circumscribed way. So one example is, you know, it's said to be the, in Canada, we have mothers in prison as, you know, mothers are elsewhere. We've also signed the International Convention on the Rights of the Child. And we also have that domesticated, that treaty, international treaty domesticated into, into our domestic law. So, you know, decisions are supposed to be about the best interest of the children, but it seemed to be in the best interest of the child to bring that child into the prison to stay with the mother, rather than keeping the mother out of prison and the child out of prison. Right. And so how can we, and I think, you know, the best interest of the child in that situation means keeping their parent out of prison and, and letting them be with their parent outside of a carceral context. But I'm in the minority view here, given what the current law is. So how can we get to an understanding of the child's rights there as a legal person that would facilitate that it's going to be a cultural shift. The same thing I think will have to happen for animals. And so these are limits of liberal states, which are so adult centered. And then we know it, it's around a certain experience of, of being an adult. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we all have time out for that in a way, but sometimes that I, I, as a thought experiment, and you know, Matthew Calarco's work on indistinction, and this idea that in a way, just to make it very fast, there one drops all lines, as it were, and we open a space that is lineless or something. And I thought sometimes, thought, what would a legal system look like if one took that, that, put that at the center and we didn't draw any lines? It just seems somehow impossible. But anyways, uh, or very difficult, at least very challenging. But it's just, uh, I'm just thinking aloud more than anything else. So the last question before the Q and A that I wanted to ask is just simply, what are you working on now and what's next as well? Because I, I never stops with these things. <laughs> yes, well, I'm very fortunate to have um, a current Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council grant, um, which is for a project that um, explores can the rule of law, um, which is still you know, such a cardinal legal concept um, exported right through from Britain, through empire building, through so many of the former and current British colonies, and also now very popular in, um, in uh, global aid development circles as well, so beyond just legal boundaries. Can this concept of the rule of law do any favorable work for animals? So in um, kind of our regular understanding of the legal landscape, we understand that animals are property, for example, in the common law. And there, there's some statutes that take account of their interests, maybe like anti-cruelty legislation and endangered species legislation. And then if we want to work for reform, we've got to convince politicians to pass other laws or do other law reform. So what I want to think about, and it's in the context of farming animals, can the rule of law actually, as a constitutional trump, right, as a constitutional tool, be used to persuade those in positions of decision-making power that this social problem, which is basically a situation of high vulnerability for animals and a state of the absence of government regulation. So in Canada, um, there is like almost nothing with respect to how animals are raised on farms. It's industry codes, which is not government regulation and they're not enforceable. Um, and Peter Sankoff at University of Alberta has a very good um, uh, article explaining the Canadian system in this regard. Okay, so can we think of, of a situation where government has not acted to respond to intense vulnerability, but in fact allows industries to continue to police themselves and I'm using that term lightly as a rule of law violation rather than just a political situation of, well, that's, you know, the politics. Um, and can we think of animal friendly legislation that comes forward as not just a matter of, well, does it, is it gonna get the majority votes to pass as a political situation, but actually um, a rule of law 
implicating um, Bill, such that those of us who are legally minded and want to do the right thing in our positions of power understand that the rule of law might be offended here and we have to take this seriously. So if you think of, if those of us who might be um, aware of the climate change litigation, right, that youth are pursuing, it's this idea that even if you know, in constitutions, in jurisdictions where constitutions don't say anything about the, climate, the right to a healthy climate, right, or that the environment has rights, uh, the argument is that the rule of law is offended here by this situation. Right, and so that's what I want to explore for animals. So there are various projects, shorter works, looking at that, articles making up that, that piece. Um, and then just more discrete projects. It does come back to my, you know, mention of children. As much as I am situated in the law school and interested in law reform and, you know, have written books and articles about it, I also think law is not a prime vehicle for social change, especially around animals and especially around eating animals. Um, which, if again, if we go back to numbers of how are animals used by humans, that's the kind of staggering, unfathomable um, industry in terms of the numbers. Um, and so I really do think that uh, intervening at a young age with children to offer alternative cultural messaging is what is going to create that transformative change that we need to see as, you know, around what we think is acceptable in terms of eating animals. And because our eating, our diets, our preferences relate so much to um, kind of like ethnic culture, right? gender, uh, geography, religion, and just then the mainstream culture and what the messages we get about animals. And, you know, as scholars have shown, as scholars of childhood interested in animal issues, uh, in many societies, the whole adulting process, we know that children's worlds are so immersive in animals and they're, that children actually see themselves in, in the stories as animals. They relate so much to animals, but then they learn through their culture, messaging many of us, right, especially growing up in a Western dominant culture, that a, a proper adult doesn't do this. Right? So it's that performance again of humanity at a certain stage. And uh, uh, you know, how can we kind of stop that adulting, anthropocentric adulting process where you know you want to shame if you, you if you are loving animals too much? And there again is the ecofeminist concern about shaming for compassion for animals, which is so gendered, again for cultural reasons, <laughs> and intervene. So that is uh, a project that I think will be probably next in line for a public publication, yes. In, and that is in um, a European text out of uh, uh, Finland. So uh, happy to mm. look out for that book. Hope everyone Yes, knows. it sounds super interesting. Um, if people want to find more about your future publications, I guess they can just check your profile on the university or just to follow up. Yes, that's there. There is also, um, it's through the university as well, but I believe anyone has access. I can put it in the chat. But yeah, yes. the university page will link to my other website. So that profile is fine. Yes. But not to, to the questions, because we've got, we've got a few, even though we only have nine minutes left because Manisha is uh, teaching later on. But um, I, I'm sorry if I don't pronounce this name correctly, but Katarzyna Oirzinska or something like that, says that, thank you very much for this talk. I'd just like to ask you about the possible implications of your idea, especially those related to the concept of a paradigmatic person for critical disability studies. That's the question? Yes, that's it. Okay, all right. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Well, that's okay. Um, Yes, uh, like so if others have argued, uh, the paradigmatic person is, is um, an exclusionary concept on a range of registers, not the least of which is ability, right? Because we know that, you know, even if um, uh, typical children might develop in a certain way, there may be other children that do not develop and then have a cognitive issue that they will never meet a cognitive standard that the paradigmatic thinks is just unnatural across um, the human experience. So um, uh, scholars like Sonora Taylor with her book, Beasts of Burden and others have written about um, kind of the overlap with animal concerns and ability concerns and actually the mutual constitution of kind of disability discrimination and anthropocentrism. And so 
even outside of thinking of animals, uh, critical scholars think that many of them, that the paradigmatic human is exclusionary uh, because it demands certain abilities that not everybody has. Wonderful. And um, uh, actually, because we here on the Zoom, people can also ask questions live if they want. So, Marine, I think uh, one of the junior fellows of our think tank, uh, she has a question, I believe. Yes, thank you, Pablo, for letting me ask a question. And thank you so much, Manisha. It's always so interesting to learn from your insights. And I really look forward to reading your book. Uh, I may have a few questions, so please just feel free to focus on what's more relevant. Uh, could you perhaps elaborate on the criteria to qualify as a legal being? And is sentience a necessary and sufficient standard? And on the other hand, uh, what would be the legal consequences of granting such status to other animals, especially farmed animals? And as a result, uh, would there be different categories of legal beings? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you also for that, those questions, Marine. So uh, yeah, sentience um, is uh, not a necessary criterion. Um, so it would be like sufficient, but not necessary. And um, in chapter five about line drawing, I take up this issue and I think, you know, one of the subheadings it's even called is sentience, the new reason, right? Like who are we excluding if we demand sentience um, for ethical mattering, for legal mattering? Um, but then I, you know, I confront uh, and Laura Goon has written about this in relation to kind of feminist new materialism and, you know, kind of the, the gravity toward just celebrating matter and entanglement, but not, and like um, putting uh, the interests, let's say of bacteria in the same level of a cow, right? And so she's saying, well, you know, I read her as saying as capacities, sentience and other capacities do matter in terms of what decisions are, what decisions we should take and how we should think of who needs protection. And so, um, I say in my book that capacities do matter, but they don't have to matter to the extent of ranking us. So it might be, yes, that if we are, if we have a higher level of intelligence, right? However that is conceived, we might perceive psychologically more devastation from something that happens to us than if we didn't have this level. But is that a reason to say those with lower levels of intelligence don't shouldn't have legal protection, I say no. Is that a reason to say um, there's a ranking here, we should rank these beings, I say no. I say it is a reason to think about what does this being with higher, having this capacity, whatever intelligence level it is, need from the law, from the state in that moment to kind of not suffer this psychological injury. It may, so, so are we gonna have a different ethical response to animals than plants? Probably categorically, yes. And so in my book, I say, I do think plants can be uh, legal beings. They, meet, they can meet the criteria of embodiment, relationality, and vulnerability. At the same time, because I'm, I'm really insistent that beingness not devolve into some welfareist instrumentalist concept and it, it hold uh, a stop against exploitation like personhood is meant to that I wouldn't extend being this to plants in a world where human beings and animals are, are needing to eat plants. So um, it's not meant to cre create different categories among legal beings, um, but uh, capacities, I argue, are ethically salient, but, but we just have to be careful as to how we say they are ethically salient and then legally salient. Wonderful. Oh, was there another one or my, my, my Marine? Do you, do you want to say something else, Manisha? Sorry, or I just don't know what you were saying. <laughs> no, I, I just hope I answered all Marine's questions. I know that. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay, so. fantastic. So then the, the next question is by Stuart Evans from the University of Winchester. Uh, he says, um, do you think there will be a time where the historically anthropocentric legal system will foster or perhaps even become a biocentric or even egocentric legislative system? And then the, he asks as well, what would that transition look like? And which country do you think would pioneer that change? 
Wow, okay. Um, thank you so much for those questions, Tori. Um, you know, I do think, like it's not going to happen tomorrow and you know, it may not happen in our lifetimes, but it may, right, that some jurisdictions do just drastically change how they're operating. Perhaps not to the level that I hope for by saying all animals are legal beings and so should not be exploited, but you know, at least somewhere along to a biocentric view of the world. Because just with the present crises, I mean, uh, these things are not gonna stop, right? If you believe the science that shows how we treat animals is related to zoonoses, to climate change, to other environmental devastation, when it starts hurting right bottom lines and profits more and more, like there will then be more of a will to change and develop different, more innovative economies. So you, we kind of see this happening in plant-based um, economies. That brings up the question of capitalism though, right? And we know that capitalism, although I don't talk about it in the book, it's almost like a background to it because I feel like any intervention against property for animals is a capitalist critique because animal, the, the commodifying animals is so central to capitalism. You cannot even imagine capitalism without it. Um, and uh, where is that appetite going to come from? Like, so the, it's not easily sourced in countries that have really entrenched themselves in this model. So that brings me back to kind of thinking differently and, and putting that message to children because we can see social change on other issues in each of our different jurisdictions, right? In the last 20, 30 years, perhaps most obviously on understanding, you know, LGBTQ2, um, issues, right? We, you see a different kind of support um, for children who have grown up in the last 20 years in schools, at least I, I definitely see that in uh, Canada, than, you know, in my generation, what I was taught in, school, in the public school system um, starting in the 70s. So uh, we can have this, and I think now, at least, you know, what is known as Canada, we're having more attention to um, human Indigenous rights, and that is coming to the school curriculum. I can see it in my own six-year-old's materials that I come home, right? And so, again, like, a different ethos is being imparted and a different message about what the world needs. And so, uh, I do think it's possible, but it's going to take kind of creative efforts now to start to build momentum. But as, as we've seen in the last few years, when there's a social need, a perceived social need, legislatures can act quickly, right, to refashion society. And it, it's, I think it's an iterative process, but there could be moments for radical change coming down the pipe. Which country will that happen? Well, that I'm not sure. Um, it's, I think it's gonna be in countries where there's a strong base of support for specific worldview that sees animals as, as, as something more than property or it feels like there is urgent reasons to do this. And that might be, you know, perhaps paradoxically in religiously oriented societies. So if you, because religion, whether we like it or not, is a powerful motivator for many people, right? I, I can't really think of maybe capitalism and profit, but I think probably religion might rank higher in terms of what pe how people conform and what they do and how they live and what they think is right and what they're haunted by at night. And so, um, countries where you may see that is where you have that high religi religiosity and it turns in favor of animals, maybe on certain issues. So, I mean, we can see some of that in India, for example, right? And I think you can look to many religious traditions and excavate those texts, even Christianity, and as scholars are doing, uh, to show that actually this is the proper way that animals should be treated. So instead of thinking, well, the plant-based message has to come out of nowhere and convince people uh, and give them a whole new value set that they have never heard of, if you can ground it in something that they really do believe in, uh, um, I think that's further traction for to expedite or accelerate the timeline. Thank you very much, Manisha, for your very general response um, to this very interesting question. And um, unfortunately, we don't have time for more questions. And um, so I will like I will now share here on the chat the, our next two events. 
Um, the first one is going to be next week. The 15th of October is our third animal conversation. Um, we are running a conversation series on animal justice and animal politics. It's going to be on disability and animality uh, and colonialism with Chloe Taylor and Kelly Struthers Monfort. And then at the end of October, we'll have a documentary viewing called Reno People uh, that Piamat where that, that sits around here in the, on the uh, audience is going to be um, sharing. And then before we finish, uh, I just wanted to ask you, Manisha, whether you would like to say a few last words or share some thoughts that you were like, oh, I should have said that and I didn't or something. Um, just that, and in case it's not clear, because I've had this confusion before, just to reiterate again, that beingness is meant to be a stop against exploitation. So it's not meant to tolerate what we now tolerate under like an, uh, uh, an anti-cruelty model where certain suffering is rationalized as okay mm. because it serves an external purpose. So um, just in case that isn't clear. And so of course it would have widespread implications, but that's the hope that we will kind of move um, to that society. Um, so yes, thank you. Thank you very much um, and yes, hopefully if we ever see legal beingness there in the legal system, that would be incredible. Uh, what a huge change it would be. But thank you very much, Manisha, for being with us today. It's been a pleasure and wonderful to have you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all and see you soon. More to follow. Bye.